This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. What's up, Detroit sports fans? Welcome back to the Fan Report, a show made by fans for fans, powered by the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I'm Nick, and coming at us from his own draft room is our boy Anderson to give us this week's topic. Well, this is our uh, post-draft recap coming fresh off round seven. Uh, we're going to give you everything from Jeff Okuda all the way to Jay Sean Cornell. We're going to take a deep dive in all these guys. It's the fan report. All right. Well, that was, uh, yeah, there's really not much to talk about this week now, is there? Was it, you, you cut off there. What were you saying? I said there's really not much to talk about this week, is there? Uh, yeah, I mean, only about eight picks, nine <laughs> picks. Um, yeah, obviously guys, we got the draft this week. Uh, so we're going to kind of give you our rundown of that. Give you our thoughts about each pick, what we think Mm -hmm. they could have done, what we wish they did. Um, but, uh, Andrew, if you want to go ahead and kind of start things off here, obviously with the first round pick, we went with, uh, Jeff Okuda at number three. Uh, and Andrew kind of give me your thoughts here, what you liked, what you don't like. Uh, and we'll go from there. All right. So, um, Sorry, I just can't everything adjusted here. Uh, so, first pick overall, we took Jeff Okuda at number three, basically as expected. Uh, the player himself, again, like I said last week, I don't mind Jeff Okuda's player. I think he's a fantastic cornerback. My question is the viability of taking a corner at number three in a league where basically you're not allowed to play cornerback. <laughs> but um, there was a lot of talk going into the draft, and especially on draft day, on Thursday, that trade talks were heating up between the Lions and our teams, especially teams like the Dolphins. Um, But apparently it was held up by the fact that the Dolphins didn't want to give up their fifth overall pick. Well, I mean, there was lots of trade, lots of Mm -hmm. potential teams that could have moved up into that three spot. There was the Dolphins, even the Mm -hmm. Giants were rumored. You had the Chargers, Mm -hmm. the Panthers, even the Cardinals. There was a lot of teams. The Jaguars were even Mm -hmm. rumored. There was a ton of teams that could have possibly moved up. What I found Mm kind of weird, though, is... Not only did the Lions not trade that number three overall pick, but there was not a single trade in the top 12 picks for the first time, I think, since like 1996 or something like that. Um, yeah. Pretty run of the mill beginning of this draft. It, it was yeah. it, it was kind of weird. It, it, it almost. I almost wish there was more chaos to happen at the top of this draft just because of the mm-hmm. format it was in with the with the remote format, you know, the. The mm-hmm. Coaches in their own houses, players in their own houses. Roger Goodell in his basement. I, I wanted. I mean, chaos. did you see Bill Belichick put his cat on camera? One, it, was one it was his dog. It was his dog. It was his dog or his yeah, cat. Yeah, it was definitely a dog. But um, anyway, so Bob Quinn actually talked about it in the uh, in the press after. He said, "I think it's probably more." He was asked about why uh, why there was no trade at number three. He said, "I think that's probably more of a question for the teams that were behind us." I don't know. We had our normal pre-draft conversations with all the teams, and the few teams that showed a little bit of interest just ultimately, you know, as we got through today, just for whatever reason, decided to stay put. I think looking back, they probably got the guys they probably would have taken at three, so it takes two teams to tango. You know what? Honestly, mm-hmm. I still blame Bob Quinn and Lions mm-hmm. organization for this entirely just because of the fact that nobody believed. And this actually, this report actually came out. Not a single team mm-hmm. believed that you were going to take a quarterback at three. Not a single team. So, of course, nobody had anything to worry about with, exactly. with getting who they wanted at their spot. That's why nobody wanted to move up, because nobody actually believed you were going to take a quarterback. Reason being, because mm-hmm. you came out and said, absolutely not, we're not going to trade Matthew Stafford. Mm-hmm. If if you let that rumor swirl around and kind of talk to Matthew behind, you know, Stafford mm-hmm. behind closed doors, and I'm sure they did, and they tried to have Stafford and his wife try to drum things up with their Instagram posts and the whole, if, if the lions are done with us, LA sounds kind of nice or something along those lines. I'm sure they, you know, wanted that to try to put up a smoke screen, but at the same time, they didn't need to come out in a press conference and absolutely deny it. They needed to make it seem a little bit more, you know, they need to come out and make it at least seem like they were willing to move on from Matthew Stafford instead of oh, exactly. being adamant that they weren't. And that's the reason why teams didn't want to trade up again. Like you said, mm-hmm. I have no problem with Jeff Okuda as a player. I just do not believe in taking a cornerback in the top three picks. Mm-hmm. I would have rather them see if I had to rank the guys I wanted them to get with what was available, not including mm-hmm. Tua at that spot. I would probably put Isaiah Simmons ahead of him. I'd probably, mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably just about 
it to be completely honest, but I would definitely yeah. put Isaiah Simmons ahead of him. But either either player, I don't, I didn't want to see in the top three. I, I if we were going to mm-hmm. pick in the top three, it was going to be two in my mind, two or Chase Young. And that's, that's why I would have loved that trade the Dolphins if we were just back, if we moved back just to five. I believe Jeff Okuda would have still been there for us to take, and we would have picked up a little bit of draft cap along. No question, Jeff um, Okuda would have still been there because Miami still would have taken two, and the Giants still would have gone offensive line. So yeah. you still would have had um, uh, Jeff Okuda at number five, probably even at number six, probably even at number seven. And the reason mm-hmm. that, and frankly, you might even have gotten him dropping all the way back to number eight, because really uh, the only team I think even has a real threat of grabbing Jeff mm-hmm. Okuda in that top 10 is the Jaguars mm-hmm. at nine. So I think yeah. you would have been perfectly fine trading back to anywhere inside that top eight to get him, but you had to make mm-hmm. it seem like somebody needed to jump. Whoever was there at five, who you need somebody needed mm-hmm. to jump up to be able to get the player they wanted, and he didn't do a good job of selling that. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna take it over to I'm gonna just uh, draw a quick basketball comparison here because I was actually watching um, the Magic Moment thirty for thirty the other day, and. In the 1994 NBA draft, uh, when the year, it was the year that the Magic took uh, Penny Hardaway. The Magic had the number one pick, and Pat Williams was deciding between Penny Hardaway and Anthony, uh, Penny Hardaway and Chris Webber. And basically, Shaq had eventually convinced him, you know, Penny Hardaway is the guy you got to take. And plus, Chris Webber would have been a bit redundant with Shaq, probably would not have meshed too well together. But um, so what he did was, and he knew that the. Uh, he knew that what was the team that he traded with? It was the team number three that year. I can't remember. The Warriors. He knew that the Warriors wanted Chris Weber. So what he did is he took Chris Weber at number one and basically used him as trade bait with the Warriors and traded him and the Warriors and then traded him. The Warriors took Anthony Hardaway. Traded him traded them Chris Weber and for Anthony Hardaway plus four future first round picks. I mean, and I was like, now what if Bob Quinn did that with Tua? I mean, it's a, it's a stretch. If I was just thinking about it, while I was watching him. Like, that would be an interesting strategy for Bob Quinn to employ. That's obviously something that's not really commonly done in the NFL. I think the last time oh, that yeah. was done in the NFL was the whole Eli Manning debacle with San Diego. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm just wondering if more... you would if you were taken to a just to use him as trade bait. Oh, I would have think it. Would have been. Don't you think that you actually would have had a, sh- a really good shot at getting Miami's fifth? Absolutely. You want to know why? Because it would have been Bob Quinn taking out a schlong and throwing it on the table and saying, look how big it is. Exactly. That's, that's, that's him saying nobody else in this room has got as big of a schlong as I do. Mm-hmm. So come and come and get what you want. It's mm-hmm. it's Tua and you're going to have to pay for him. Why? Because we have them and you don't and you want them. So come yeah. and get them. Now, teams could potentially wait it out, but I think the Lions would be fine with that. Because then they'd have their successor at quarterback. It's a win-win for them to do that. Now, is that something mm-hmm. that's commonly done in the NFL? Absolutely not. It is. It just isn't. This nope. it's it's more done in the NBA where a team will take a player and then throw them out as a potential trade option. The reason it's not done in the NFL is because it's a lot messier and it's a lot more difficult to do than just trading oh, a yeah. pick. But however, would I have been absolutely ecstatic to see the Lions do that? Hell yeah. Do you know how much drama that would have created? Do you know how much media attention? <laughs> the Lions insanity. would have been the talk of the draft at that point. And that would have been awesome. <laughs> Finally, we get some fun some fun conversation in this damn town. You still would have gotten your guy in Jeff Okuda, and we probably would have gotten some draft capital out of it. So. Most likely. they probably What they could have done is gone to Miami and say, look, we got two at three. We mm-hmm. want you to take Jeff Okuda at five, and then we want number 18. Mm-hmm. and maybe your third round pick or fourth round pick or whatever mm-hmm. else they want. And then they get what they want. They get the guy mm-hmm. they wanted. They get them technically at five and they get more draft capital. So guess what? It's a, that, that would have been an absolute win win. And if, and if frankly, mm-hmm. if the Miami dolphins didn't want to bite on it, then so be it. You got two mm-hmm. a tongue of Iloa and guess what? You're fine. And if frankly, if Miami didn't want to bite, you're hanging up and saying, all right, fine. I'll go call LA. They mm-hmm. want a quarterback. The Chargers wanted a quarterback, so hey, Chargers, go ahead, draft Jeff Okuda. We'll give you two a tongue of Iloa. You give us an, your first round pick from next year and your third round pick from this year, and we'll you know we'll move on from this. I'm sure the Chargers would have loved to have uh, two a tongue of Iloa. I would probably agree with you. <laughs> so, and it, then the the other thing I like to look at too is um you saw the Packers take uh to a lot of people's dismay in Green Bay, I guess Jordan Love out of Oregon. Um, my it's, question, what? Go ahead. Yeah, my my quite like, and so they they basically they could use him in two ways: either a an insurance policy for Aaron Rodgers, basically the way the same way they used Aaron Rodgers when Brett Favre was the quarterback, where 
where it's just like you know bring him up under Brett Favre, let him run under his tutelage. But also, it's it's not it's not a secret that Aaron Rodgers was not himself last season, and I would even go as far as to say the season before as well. Well, let me ask nothing you this. breeds in... nothing breeds success more than competition. So they bringing in bringing in another quarterback like to fire on Aaron Rodgers' ass to actually get going. So I I I just I'm left wondering what drafting two. I mean, done I don't really think Matthew Aaron Stafford Rodgers. Tra- I don't really think Aaron Rodgers is is a guy that really needs to have a fire lit under his ass. I don't really think mm-hmm. it's that. I think it absolutely was drafting the successor and having yeah. him sit underneath the Hall mm-hmm. of Famer the future hall of famer for a few, you know, a couple of years mm-hmm. before they feel he's ready. And then the hall of famer is already to retire. It's obvious yeah. that Aaron Rodgers is going to start at least has already started to have a downturn in his career. I mean, the dude's what 38 mm-hmm. years old now. He's not young anymore. He's not the same quarterback that he was five, six, seven years ago. It's just a fact. So they're going to oh, have I to. Jordan Love is out of Utah State, not Oregon. I apologize. Yeah, Utah State. <laughs> yeah. uh, Oregon was Justin, uh, Justin yeah, Herbert. Justin Herbert. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're, you're eventually going to have to replace him. You found a guy that you, I guess, like. I know Jordan Love isn't quite NFL ready. I know he's got some detractors. I know he's got some issues with mm-hmm. his game. But that doesn't mean he can't be coached right. underneath Aaron Rodgers for two years. And I, one of my favorite things I saw about it was, Aaron Rodgers is going to hate Jordan Love just like Brett Favre hated Aaron Rodgers. And mm-hmm. look at the success that came of that. So, frankly, I I don't understand why it's a negative, why so many people are so against this. Aaron Rodgers is not young. His years are numbered at this point. Is he going to play until he's 43 like Tom Brady? Yeah. Probably not. Most guys don't. And Tom Brady's a nutcase and walking into the wrong people's houses at the, at his old age. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, oh, probably God. a good chance that Aaron Rodgers isn't here for another five years. Yeah. So they're going to have to potentially look at a replacement and th- this could have been the guy they had a chance to get a solid high end quarterback where they were drafting and they hoped to not be drafting any higher than they were this year. So yeah, I, I'm fine with it, but no, I agree with you. If Tua was there behind Matthew Stafford, would it have lit a fire underneath Stafford's ass? Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. Would it allow Tua to learn and grow and be groomed into a great quarterback in the NFL? Yeah, maybe. It's something that I've been wanting the Lions to do to grab Tua Tungvaluwa. And frankly, if they don't get, if they have another bad year, guess who I'm going for next year? Trevor Lawrence. Why? Because it's time to start looking at a possible replacement we've had yeah. matthew stafford now for 10 years we haven't won a damn thing is that necessarily his fault mm-hmm. no absolutely not he's been <laughs> very good however when something just isn't working it's time to start a, a rebuild now i'm not saying do that this year not even saying do that next year. I'm just saying it's something that the Lions are going to have to potentially start looking at in the next couple of years coming. It's just the fact of the matter. So, again, still at, there? I'm here. Are you still there? I guess we lost Andrew. Okay. Well, he'll have oh, no, I'm back. Okay. I'm back. All right. Um, well, I guess we'll technical difficulties there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no. Right, it, but were you I, asking a question? I apologize. <laughs> no, I wasn't. You're good. Okay. Um, so, uh, but again, it, it, do I like Jeff Okuda as a player? Yes. Obviously, he was a guy mm-hmm. that he's a he was a very highly touted player at his position, the number one player at his position in this draft. I'm good with that. I'm happy with that. However, I just don't believe in that position at that high of a pick. Yeah. However, if I were to grade mm-hmm. the Lions' no, first overall draft pick or third overall draft pick, I should say their their first pick. I give it like a B plus, and that's re- exactly what I give and, it because and the reason is because only thing that knocks it down is just the lack of getting draft capital out of it. Right, you could have gotten the same guy if you would have done a better job selling uh, selling a smoke screen this off mm-hmm. season. And so, frankly, as a player, Jeff Okuda is an A, but where you got him, I have to give him a B plus for it. It's a good pick. It yeah, is like- a good pick. Yeah, they, He's a good player. The talk about something like they did a terrible job doing that. Like every, every time that there was those those Stafford trade rooms, they shut them down. They barely made any effort to to show that they have interest in Tua. There was that one report that came out like back in January. <laughs> so, right, like, exactly. You know, 
Now, the <laughs> argument for a guy, for them having, you know, drafting a guy like mm-hmm. an Isaiah Simmons or a Derek Brown, and personally, I would have preferred mm-hmm. Isaiah Simmons over Derek Brown. Agreed. But the argument for drafting a guy like Isaiah Simmons is how deep the cornerback position was in this draft. The mm-hmm. amount of corners available in the second round would have been something that the Lions could have taken a look at and grabbed very high end talent there. Or even the mm-hmm. third round had some solid cornerback uh, prospects sitting there wait at their spot. So the fact that they didn't go and grab a corner, you know, the fact that they didn't go a different route when they could have it, it says something. However, again, Jeff Okuda is a good player. No doubt about it. Yeah. So should we go ahead and move on into the second round here? Well, I, I do want to give one other take because uh, just, just to give a little bit of a positive spin on this is, I do think with this pick, even with Darius leaving, I do think this um, this makes this the secondary, well, specifically our corners, a position of strength with this team, because I do believe that Okuda is good enough to be a lockdown corner. Oh, I mean, the guy and draws I, Patrick Peterson comparisons. Yeah, he could and, I, and I also actually really corner. like in our in our secondary. I actually do really do believe that Amani Oruwari is primed to take a big step forward. And we also have Desmond Trufant there. Um, Marcus so, Trufant. But Desmond Trufant. Is it Marcus or Desmond? Desmond, sir. But <laughs> but uh, I, I do believe that specifically Oruwari right. and Okuda together, I do think make can make a pretty formidable um, cornerback tandem if they both live up to their potential. Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't think Oruwari Ar- is going to see anything above the number four corner this year. I really don't. Um, mm-hmm. Desmond Trufant is your number two guy. He is going to, yeah, cover, he is, he is mm-hmm. your number two guy. And then in the slot, you are going to have Justin Coleman. He's arguably the best slot corner mm-hmm. in the NFL. And that lions paid him big money to be, mm-hmm. to be one of the better corners in the NFL. And now he's going to be in a position that he's very comfortable with. Your number one is going to be Jeff Okuda on the outside. He is going to be the guy that's asked to be put on an Island. So you're looking at Jeff Okuda, Desmond Trufant, on the other on the other side, and then you've got Justin Coleman in the slot to uh, to cover that Nick that third wide out or even tight ends that are stepping out out wide if the if he's asked to. Right there, yeah. those three guys, I am very confident can be a a strength on this defense, a strength because I think Justin Coleman is a fantastic nickelback, and I think Desmond Trufant and Jeff Okuda are one of the more solid defensive back duo, the cornerback tandems in the nfl if you ask me yeah that's my own personal opinion now mm-hmm. bringing in oruarie as a number four guy or even stepping into the outside when you know to give desmond true final blow fine that's uh, you know i don't have a big issue with that i'd like to see him take a step up this year but last year he didn't mm-hmm. really impress me all that much so i oh. need to see him take that step oh, yeah, up this true. year what and i liked in the limited time that he got i thought he was productive yeah but... man eh, eh. eh. Again, he played. He played what, like fifteen to twenty percent of snaps. He got two picks, like twenty tackles. Yeah, but he also got burned. That was a lot. good. He also got yeah. burned a lot. Everybody mm-hmm. on the defensive in the defensive backfield got. Well, yeah, our secondary as a whole, was, our yes. secondary as a whole did not perform. So again, I I really don't see Ar- Armani Awari is going to get anything more than mm-hmm. you know the a little bit higher of a of a of a snap share that he got last year, just because he's going to move into the number four spot, but. I don't mm-hmm. see him taking one or two. I don't see him taking three because he's not a, he's not going to take the nickel back from Justin Coleman. But with the top three yeah. guys that we have, I think that's an absolute strength for this defense between Okuda, Trufan, and Coleman as at the nickel. Yeah. So love love what we got back there. <clears throat> um, uh, let's move on to the second. Yeah, let's go ahead and move on in the second round here. Um, Lions this, picked at three again. This is the pick where I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I fully expect the pick to be AJ Espinosa. Uh, Espinosa. I but, do um, actually. Not gonna lie. I remember I texting do. you. I'm like, I, I like Espinosa here or one of the running backs. I was, I was, I wanted one of the running backs, but I knew Espinosa made a lot more sense. I mean, there was but, honestly a lot of routes the Lions could have gone with an yeah. edge rusher here because they could have gone Espinosa. Mm-hmm. They could have also gone mm-hmm. the kid from Penn State and yet Sir Gross Matos. Mm-hmm. Um, they so there was a lot of potential for them to look at edge here. And that's kind of why yeah. I thought they were going to lean that route is they, I felt like they were going to mm-hmm. lean edge and they did it. 
Um, they they went the running back route and grabbed DeAndre Swift at number three. And Which I was ecstatic about. <laughs> I was too, because DeAndre Swift is regarded as as potentially the number one guy at his position in this draft. So in the first two mm-hmm. rounds, you grab the number one corner and potentially the mm-hmm. number one running back. So that tells yep. you right there that someone did their homework very well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um the Lions played the draft board as good as you could, as good as you could mm-hmm. right now. And they, and honestly, if they would have taken any of the three running backs available there, either DeAndre mm-hmm. Swift, JK Dobbins, or um, the kid from Wisconsin is uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Taylor. Taylor. Yep. I, I would have been happy with any of them to be completely Agreed. honest with you. Uh, and I would have been happy with gross Matos or Epinesa. And if, frankly, I would even have been happy with Robert hunt, the offensive mm-hmm. lineman from Louisiana. So, but, but Swift aside from, being at least who you and I think are is the best cornerback in this draft, uh, cornerback running back in this draft. I do think he's the best fit for this team, and that's largely based on his pass catching ability. He's fantastic. Oh, hundred percent. He he's an absolutely fantastic pass catcher. He was a big time playmaker for um, Georgia. He was a guy mm-hmm. who really uh, can make an impact and, and can make the game breaking play. Uh, he mm-hmm. caught two. He, I mean, he caught 24 passes for 200 over 200 yards last year in a touchdown, along mm-hmm. with rushing for over 1,200 yards and seven touchdowns of his own. So he was yeah. absolutely dominant on the ground, and he could absolutely make a a big time tandem with Carryon Johnson back there. At the very least, mm-hmm. you're looking at a one two punch that's going to be able to keep both of them healthy. And that's the big thing mm-hmm. with DeAndre Swift is he's healthy. He's never, as far as I know, never had sustained a major injury in college. That I got wood right here that I'm knocking on. Exactly. That, <laughs> right. Right. It, it gives you a reason to have some hope, and it allows carry on Johnson to also stay healthy. So I'm loving the fact that we grabbed another running back to mm-hmm. run in tandem with carry on to keep them both comfortable, keep them both healthy, and keep them both fresh. Mm-hmm. And it's a dangerous duo. Frankly, mm-hmm. I'd run DeAndre Swift out as my number one and carry on as my number two. That's that's the route I'd go. You could. Yeah. You could very well do that. I mean, or you can just do that general running back, kind of like what the Saints had with Ingram and um, and Kamara. You can just do a running back tandem and see how it goes. You absolutely could. That's another option mm-hmm. they could go. Um, but, I mean, DeAndre Swift was, in my mind, a home run pick. If I, if I were to give it a grade, I'd give it an A. It, it was a great mm-hmm. pick in my mind. It was a guy, it was a position in need, obviously. Mm-hmm. It, and it's a big-time playmaker. He's a game-breaking talent. Yeah. at that position so and the fact that you got number guys at the number one you know ranked number one at their position in the first two rounds that's that's a big win in my mind that's a big win agreed and then um ready to move on to round three um or do you have anything else to say about uh no i think i'm just about ready i mean if you had to compare mm-hmm. deandre swift to a current player in the nfl who would you who would you say all right, uh, oh, that's that's a tough one. Um, I actually do compare. I mean, not size wise, but play style. I actually do com- uh, compare him to Alvin Kamara type. Now, the, the 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 comparisons I've seen have gone anywhere from Saquon to Frank Gore, and I've se- and he even got because of his ability to start stop on a dime and his scat back kind of approach. He did get those Barry Sanders comparisons in college as a lot of running backs do early on. Right. Um, everybody but, does uh, early on. Yeah. Cause everybody, if you're, if you're good, everybody mm-hmm. looks really good in college. Mm-hmm. If you're good, you look really good in college. I mean, guy Agreed. averaged 6.2 yards a carry. That's mm-hmm. those numbers will never happen in the NFL. Um, the, yeah. the pro comparison that I'm going to give to him is a guy is uh Delvin cook, uh, dual threat like type of back, too. dual threat type of back, able to be shifty, mm-hmm. able to make plays happen. He's got big playability. Um, so let's hope he stays healthier than Dalvin Cook. But he's <laughs> a guy that I can that I do believe can succeed in a number one or even a number two role in this offense. So mm-hmm. I'm hoping I, I I would really hope that the Lions really utilize this guy to the best of his to the to his fullest potential because mm-hmm. I I'm really liking their backfield tandem right now. Oh yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on to number three. And last week, we'd actually kind of joked around like, hey, what if we were able to pair Romeo Aquara and Julian Aquara? Well, look what happened. We got Julian Aquara. We did. <laughs> uh, so, brothers reunited. And Julian Aquara is nothing to be scoffed at. He's a fantastic edge rusher, explosive, athletic, and versatile. So, I I have no issues taking Julian Aquara. He was one of my favorite edge rushers in this range. Um but I love it, I, and I do. And I actually believe that pairing him with his brother, like 
I think that's going to motivate both of them to do better, to actually feed off each other. So I, now I like does it. He, he play on the same side as, as his brother, or does he play on the side of Trey Flowers? Um, to be honest with you, I don't know. Okay, because I really don't know either. Um, but he's I I I I love the Julian O'Quara pick. I do think it's mm-hmm. it's also not only just a cool story that he gets to play with his brother. I do think you're right. I do think it'll motivate him. Um, mm-hmm. he's a guy who I think will get better throughout time. I think you're going to see a little bit of raw ability to begin with, but and then oh, as agreed. He, as he Agreed. progresses, you're going to see him turn into a more crafty, creative, and just effective player as time goes by. So I don't really have high immediate expectations for him, but I do have high expectations long term for Julian Oquara. I mean, I think Romeo Oquara putting up, you know, the numbers that he had put up in in the Lions defense and pass. Looks like he's lined up on both sides, by the way. Okay, all right. Um, I I think he's a guy who could really be something good. Now he does have to stay healthy. He did have a down year last year in terms of he saw a drop in his production. Then his season ended yeah. uh, prematurely with the broken leg, but he did have an impressive junior year. Uh, his junior year was fantastic, but um, he's yeah, a guy he, was, who, he was on a trajectory to be higher than a third round pick before. Right. That injury. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's a guy. I think we got good value there. I, I do. Mm-hmm. I think he's a guy who could potentially be a second round talent that ended up mm-hmm. in the third round falling to us due to injury in a, in a, a down yeah. year at, at, in his senior year. But mm-hmm. Yeah. A broken leg is not something that's gonna be like a recurring injury. Like that's just something you recover from and keep moving. Right. Um. Well, we hope. Uh. Things. Yeah. Things can be weird, but he's a yeah. guy who's got the ability to chase down tackles. He's a guy who can make plays. He's he's mm-hmm. got to be able to. And the fact that he's gonna be lining up either opposite of his own brother or opposite of Trey Flowers, I think, will be give him some opportunities as well because it'll keep the defense away from Mm -hmm. doubling him as often as they as you would think but so i think the fact that he's going to be playing up against or playing with some one a familiar face and two some upper echelon talent in my mind i think that's going to help him out a lot too so i like him a lot he's he is lanky he might have to put a little bit of weight on but i he's also quick um, I, I, I like the Juno Quara pick. It was also a mm-hmm. position of need for the lions exactly. in, in the third round. And it was absolutely fantastic. If you ask me. So oh, again, an, another ha- happy with yet another pick for the lions here. And I like, and I loved where they got him. I think it was great value. And that, that video of, uh, him and his brother embracing when he got drafted was, that was so cool to watch. Oh, absolutely. Um, now if you had to give a grade to this pick, what would you give it? Um, I'm at an A minus with this pick. A minus with this pick. I'm going to agree with mm-hmm. you. I'll, I'll go with an A minus as well. Um, I thought that the uh, Lions made a very good pick here. Uh, mm-hmm. Position of need. And that seemed to be the recurring theme with the Lions in this draft was position of need mm-hmm. and taking the best player yeah. available at position of need. Now, um, yep. let me look at something real quick. Now, the players that were would have been available to the Lions at that spot that they could have grabbed. Um in terms of what they were looking at at that position, you can look at Zach Bond, the outside linebacker from Wisconsin, who really... Uh, I know you really liked Bradley and I, but he actually fell to the uh, last pick in the fifth round. Right. I was really shocked yeah. by that. I, mm-hmm. I thought Bradley and I had a, was a much better player yeah. that, that was going to go much higher than that. But you could look at Jabari Zuniga, yeah. the defensive end from Florida. Um, you could have looked at ne- Neville mm-hmm. Gil- Gallimore, for the uh, defensive tackle from Oklahoma. Terrell mm-hmm. Lewis, the outside linebacker from Alabama, was a guy who was looked at quite a bit. Anthony Jennings yeah. also. Um, there was a lot of names that they could have gone with that were available, mm-hmm. but I do think Julian O'Quara was the best of the bunch to look at, so I was very happy with the pick there. Yeah. And then uh, and then we moved back into the third round. Uh, trade with the Colts to take uh, offensive lineman out of Ohio State in Jonah Jackson. Uh, he plays guard. And a lot of people actually view this as a reach well, because if I remember right, wasn't this there because they were already in the third round and then they moved back because didn't they have two third round yeah, they, to begin with? I think they might have been the back of the third round and moved up a little bit and gave up. Yeah, I think, I like think that's what it was. A six or something I think like that. that's what it was because they moved up to 75 to mm-hmm. Jonah Jackson. Yeah. But if you look at, for example, if you look at a lot of people, the reason why a lot of people thought this, if you look at the NFL.com draft projection, for example, for Jordan Jackson, he's projected in rounds five through six. Uh, but the uh, I didn't know much about him because I don't pay too much. I'm not an offensive lineman at heart, so I don't pay too much attention to the offensive line play. But the general consensus that I've seen around him as a player 
has been very good and kind of just kind of they've they've basically viewed him as a a player who doesn't get enough didn't get enough attention in the draft process. Uh, they also uh, describe him as having a lot of range, uh, having obviously he's huge and NFL quality in terms of his tenacity, in terms of his technique, and the fact that he projects as a future starter. Which if you're getting a future, as long as you're getting a starting caliber offensive lineman in the third, like when you're in the third round, I'm, I'm I got no complaints. Um. I, I mean, this could have been looked at as a reach because he was graded a little bit further back. Um, you yeah. can't really fault the Lions' ideals of going after Ohio State offensive linemen because Ohio State mm-hmm. offensive linemen, uh, you know, they breed they had they breed good talent. Um, mm-hmm. He didn't start off his college career very well. I believe he started out at Rutgers before transferring. If I am mm-hmm. reading right, or if I remember right, mm-hmm. um, but he is a a very you know he's a solid player in on the interior line he's a guy who's going to kind of fill a hole that was left by graham glasgow i do so wish we would have re-signed glasgow and then maybe potentially mm-hmm. drafted this guy to fill in as a rotational guy but if he's a guy who could potentially step into a starting role and be effective as an offensive lineman or even like a ta- um a guy that they can rely on to rotate in um that and be a you know effective along the o-line and protect mm-hmm our uh, quarterback and and maybe make some holes for the, um, for the running back tandem of carry on and Deandre Swift to run through. I'd be happy. I mean, if you you look at his game tape, he made a lot of holes in that offensive line for us. Right. He's a guy that he's a guy that can make plays happen. So Mm -hmm. I'm, I, you know, I like a guy. I always love Mm -hmm. drafting guys that are in the trench, especially in those rounds three and four, because that's where you find some of the best talent there. So I liked it a lot. I'm good with it. So there we go. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we uh, turned around in the fourth round and drafted another guard in Logan. And um, this is another guy that I actually did not know much about going into the draft process. But looking at his, uh, first of all, (laughs) one interesting thing I saw about him was his uh, game tape was described as O-line coach porn. (laughs) (laughs) But looking at his film, he's an absolute mauler. He uh, really is. So I, think I, saw, like, I kind of I think, fell in love with this kid just watching the film. I think I saw a stat of his career at Kentucky, which, mind you, plays in the SEC. So but yeah. in his career at Kentucky, he had like 604 um, pass block opportunities and gave up a total of zero mm-hmm. sacks, which is unbelievable, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, mm-hmm. The guy playing an interior lineman. At, in the SEC and doesn't give up a single sack there. I'm excited about that. That's for damn sure. Um, he is mm-hmm. he is an absolute mauler. He's a guy who I think is going to rotate in just as much as Jonah Jackson is, um, if not potentially even grab a starting job. I definitely think there's going to be a, a camp battle going on between those two, and I love camp battles between mm-hmm. rookies because it fires them oh, both yeah. up and forces them both to get their techniques right. So definitely gonna I'm definitely mm-hmm. excited about this pick, and I don't know how you can get all that excited about drafting an interior lineman but mm-hmm. i'm excited it, he is a guy who looks like he could be something along a mainstay along this offensive line yeah. i, I want to give you a couple quotes from him because this reminds me of a certain person that people love here in detroit but he uh he did say he wants to bring the nasty back into the game uh which earned him the nickname mr nasty uh, <laughs> he said i'm going to see where you're weak and i'm going to expose that and make you feel embarrassed you got to really intimidate them, play with their mind, and you got to beat them physically. I believe if you're focused on me more than what you're supposed to be doing, I've won the battle. Tell me, does it remind you of Bill Lambeer? That's bit, exactly yeah. what Bill bit. Lambeer would say. Um, I, I like that he's willing to uh, – I like that it tells me that he's going to have a, a, a rough, tough workman's, workman's mentality, which is something that Detroit fans here endear, mm-hmm. endear themselves to, and mm-hmm. it's something that can – get a lot of fans on his side mm-hmm. and hopefully get uh, the yeah. coaching staff on his side as well um, to give him some playing time and make and be effective on yeah. that old line. So hopefully Being a real blue collar guy down there, which right. Which and I that's love. Detroit fans love that. So mm-hmm. he's a guy we can get behind here. I like it. All right, moving on to the fifth round. So let we me took... hold on now before we move on, yeah. let's go ahead and grade rounds three mm-hmm. and four. Um, okay, yeah. cause we, we gave the Julian Aquara pick an A minus, but now let's go ahead and actually let's grade the, the offensive lineman picks. I, I think up to this point in the draft outside of not being able to make a deal in round one, I think the lions are on a roll. So I, 
I give, along with what I gave the offensive line pick, I give the draft overall up to this point an A minus. I'm gonna agree with you on the A minus for the draft up until this point. Um, not quite an A because mm-hmm. um, there, you know, there could have been a question on whether or not they could have gotten a better player than Jonah Jackson in the late third round. I do like Jonah mm-hmm. Jackson. I think he's a very fine player. Um, yeah. I do like the fourth round pick as well. Um, but the reason I, I give an A minus here and the, and it's especially because of the fact that we have filled positions of need. We had a lot of mm-hmm. holes in this team and the lions knew that. And they went and, and Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia knew that. And they went after as good a talent as they could to fill those holes. And that's exactly what they've done here. Drafting Jeff Okuda, drafting Julian Okwara, um, drafting Giandre Swift, and then, then drafting the uh, a tandem of uh, interior linemen to replace a, a couple mm-hmm. of guys that you lost in the off season. So, I, I loved it. Absolutely love that the way they've strategized their draft to, to this point here. So let's go move on into round five. Yeah. Uh, going on round five, we took our first wide receiver in Quintez Cephas. Uh, he's a wide receiver out of Wisconsin. 6'1", 202. So he's got nice size. Um, but what, were you really, what really gave me pause when I initially looked at him was a 4'7", 340. So I'm like, that's awfully slow. But then what made me turn around was Jeff Okuda coming out and saying that this is the hardest receiver that he ever had to guard against, and he had to change up his game plan every time he went against him. It's um, probably having to do with the fact he's probably a very physical receiver. <laughs> yeah. And he probably runs good routes. Again, I don't know oh, enough dude, about this guy. The guy's a house. If you look at his body and his build, dude's <laughs> insane. But, but, again, I, I do wonder if, like, Jeff Okuda kind of advised on this back. <laughs> I mean, I doubt he actually advised. Let's let's be real. <laughs> so, um, when they gave him that phone call that that they drafted, when they gave Jeff Okuda the phone call, they drafted him. Like, okay, so real quick, um, who's a really good receiver in the Big Ten that you had to guard? <laughs> um, one thing I do think that the, he can fill a role in here, mm-hmm. and, and tell me if this reminds you of of, of someone here. Um, but giving you an idea of his of his body, he's six foot one, two hundred and two pounds, and you can imagine he's probably going to put about put about ten to fifteen pounds on in the NFL as well. Um, yeah. he's a big dude. And he, mm-hmm. he's uh, he's built, um, but the way that I picture this guy, the the role I picture him playing is a possession receiver who can be an out on third down, be a guy that can get you that seven mm-hmm. eight yard catch on mm-hmm. third down in traffic and just move the chains. Mm-hmm. So I, in the I, last, I agree with you. And, and in the last ten look years, at his size who does that his, remind you? And his in his combine measurables, to me, it, it tells me in terms of who it reminds me of, to me, his ceiling would be like an Anquan Bolden type. Exactly the type of player mm-hmm. that I'm thinking of. Exactly the yep. type of player I'm thinking of is, is an Anquan Bolden type of role in this offense mm-hmm. where he's not going to get you the massive plays. He's not going to burn anybody. He's just going to go up, run a physical route, and mm-hmm. catch a ball for 7, 8, 11 yards, get you a first down, get the chains moving, and you bring, and you bring your burners back out to make a play. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a guy yeah. that you can rely on and I hope he's a player that can make things happen because if we can get a guy like that, that's as solid as a guy like Anquan Bolden was, I will be very happy in this offense because he was a player that can move the chains mm-hmm. whenever you ask them to. Yep. And I, I know before last week I was saying that I think a, rec- a type of receiver that would fit this offense would be a small speed slot. Um, but I, when I think about it now, I realize we don't have this type of receiver on our team either. No. So this is a fit. Absolutely. Uh, and this is a very specialty receiver that, again, is only going to get a, a certain amount of run in the offense, and a lot of it's going to be on third down. But if he's a, if he's a reliable mm-hmm. target and he develops a rapport with Matthew Stafford, um, mm-hmm. that's someone you're going to really like to watch come Sunday. Yeah. Uh, our, other, our other pick, six uh, picks later in the fifth round, uh, Jason Huntley, running back out of New Mexico State. Uh, this is an interesting one because a lot of people were scratching their heads. Why did we just take another running back? Um, I'm of the belief, obviously, I'm not in the locker room or, or in the front office. I don't know for sure what their plan for him is. But I'm of the belief because he's a very speedy guy and he did uh, carry a lot of uh, kick return duties uh, in college. I think they are looking at him as a kick return specialist. The guy did have five kick returns for a touchdown. In um in college, and they were both in the span of all five were in the span of two years. He he's a very elusive back once he gets in space. So I I personally think this wasn't 
so much a running back depth play as we need a return. Now, do you want to use a fifth round pick when you still had a guy like Bradley and I still available there? That is my question. But that's uh, right. That's right. How I view this pick. Personally, I would have preferred the Lions to go Bradley and I. Um, I'm. Mm-hmm. I believe that a kick return specialist in in the NFL of today is a massive luxury just because how many kicks just go out the back of the end zone now. Exactly. Um, and maybe he's a punt return guy too, but again, a guy who's a kick return specialist in the fifth round, I don't, I mean, I know Jamal Agnew was nice. Um, and we don't know if he's going to be continuing to take kicks. Is he, I don't even know Mm -hmm. if they resigned him or not, but, um, either way, again, I do think it's a little bit of a luxury pick. And with a guy like Bradley and I available, I don't care how many edge rushers you have. If they're good, take them. Uh, Bradley mm-hmm. and I is a guy who would have been wonderful to have come in in rotation Insane with Oquara, value at this stage right, too. with Oquara, with the two Oquaras, with Trey Flowers, be a fourth guy there and wreak havoc on backfields against rotational offensive mm-hmm. linemen. A lot of times that he'd end up facing, I would have loved mm-hmm. to see the Lions go uh, edge rush again with Bradley and I here mm-hmm. and continue to build that position, that position group. Because again, I think edge rush is uh, pass rush is one of the most important aspects of a defense. It helps out your defensive backs. It helps out your linebackers, and it makes play. Excuse me, it makes plays happen, happen, and kills drives on the other side of the football. So I would have loved to see them go with another edge rusher here and may, and grab a guy in Bradley and I that I would have thought was an insane yeah. value, like you said. Yeah. But again, uh, Jason Hundley is a bit. I, I agree with you. I do think he is more of a kick return specialist. Mm-hmm. He did have some effective uh, running in in the backfield for Texas A and M. He is a good player. I just don't know how much run he's going to get behind both Carrion Johnson and DeAndre Swift. I don't know if he's going to be a third down specialist or what, but we're going to find out. So, um, I will say at round five, page twenty-one, we drafted Quintez uh, Cephas. That I honestly, when I when I was watching, when I was looking at the draft board, and I was seeing all right, our picks coming up. Bradley and I still on the board. I fully expect. I fully expected us with that Quintez pick at uh, 166. I expected that to be Bradley and I because Bradley and I was a standout in the Senior Bowl, which Patricia coached, as well as the fact that we called an I back in for a pre-draft interview also. So we showed pretty significant interest in him. And the fact that his position in need and the fact that it was a value pick there, I really expected us to take him at 21, at round 5 pick 21, and when he wasn't, when he wasn't picked there. I kind of lost hope that they picked me around five pick twenty seven. We took Huntley, but I, I agree with you that I would have loved to see Bradley and I there at absolutely, five, absolutely. At round, either either pick in round five. Because again, I as as good of a player as Jason mm-hmm. Huntley could be in terms of kick returns, and even as a third down specialist or an opportunist in the backfield, change of pace type of back. Um, I think more value would have come of drafting a guy like Bradley and I because he's a guy that you probably would mm-hmm. ro- would rotate in all the time. So and is, higher ceiling, right? Like. Agreed. So let's all go right, ahead. and then let's take round six and seven together because they're both defensive tackles. Well, one's um, a D end. I thought Jason Cornell was a D end. I think they're both interior linemen. That's not what I'm seeing here. Hang on. Yeah. Um, but go ahead and take uh, mm-hmm. the sixth round pick here. Yeah. All right. I'll take uh, I'll take John Penicini out of Utah. Uh. This is another big dude. He primarily he's a he primarily plays nose tackle, so he's only going to really get some run when you try out that three four scheme. He's a defensive tackle. Why does that? Um, but he's also but he also fills a need that we've lost, which is a go to run stopper, and that is that is this guy's specialist. Is he's a run stopper, and we, since since we lost snacks. I think that's what we really needed to focus on in the uh, interior line is guys who could specialize in stopping the run. So, so I think obviously it's not as good of a defensive tackle as you want to see us come out with in this draft. But when you're taking your first interior lineman at round six, I only could have hoped for much better. Right, and and that's one of the things that. Well, excuse me. I think is actually a negative from the Lions draft is they didn't address mm-hmm. the interior defensive line need until the sixth mm-hmm. round, and and. That could yeah. be looked at as a big negative because the Lions lost Snacks mm-hmm. Harrison. Um, they lost Mike Daniels. So, and yes, they did bring in Danny Shelton, but he is a guy who was kind of thrown in the trash heap by the Patriots. And I know they brought in someone else as well. I can't, it's slipping my mind right now. But mm-hmm. um, you, you're filling a really important role on your defense because you, the Lions last year had an absolutely 
terrible run defense, but you're filling a, an important role on your defense and, and being the premier run stopper, the premium run stopper. That guy's name. <laughs> what? Dude from the Eagles who you're talking about, right? I'm still I know. Name. Um, <laughs> Uh, but continue. Sorry, sorry but to interrupt. <laughs> it's it's an important position in on this Lions defense, especially after what you what we watched last year with how much they struggled at stopping the run. And you filled it with a guy who was thrown away by the Patriots and Danny Shelton, and then a and then a sixth and a seventh round draft pick. So where what's the what exactly is the Lions ceiling at stopping the run? Because the guys you drafted, like Julian O'Quara, isn't exactly a guy who is very is well known at stop for stopping the run. He's a, he's a pass rusher. Um, so it may be a stopping the run, maybe a weakness for the lions once again this year. So I, I would have liked to see them maybe invest a little bit more in stopping the run in this draft, but they didn't, they, they ended up going, yeah. going at run stoppers in the sixth and seventh round picks. And I know the sixth round pick is a guy who is known for stopping the run and maybe he could be a, a mainstay along that D line at the nose tackle position at a three tacky position, maybe even, but we'll find out what he is and what he can do. Um, I, I hope he's as good. And I hope that the only reason he was taken is he was looked at as a sixth round pick or a late round pick is just because of the fact that he's got one job and one job only. And that's to stop the run. And a lot of those guys aren't mm-hmm. as highly regarded because um, they only play certain downs. So yeah. I'm hoping that's just the case. And he's a, a, a monster when it comes to stopping the run. So that that's my hope mm-hmm. for this guy here. Yeah. And he, like, I guess you could say that in the third round, when we took Jonah Jackson. I mean, you had guys like Jordan Elliott from Missouri still on the board, right. which is another dude that I liked. But I, I guess you could say that that would have been a nice spot to tackle, uh, defense tackle, no pun intended, and uh, and then still still stick with uh, with the guard that you took in the fourth round. But I mean, Nick Williams I mean, was another defensive tackle they they signed. Yeah, they signed Danny go. Shelton, Nick Williams. But like, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is. Outside of taking a kick returner in the fifth round, or a guy who projects, uh, at least that I project to be a kick returner in the fifth round, I think they hammer position, positions in need all throughout the draft. So, like, that's what I'm trying bears. to struggle. Like, where would you where would you switch out to take the D lineman? The only spot I can think of, which would be probably my least favorite pick up to this point where we can still get a quality D lineman, is Jonah Jackson in the third. Um, I can't necessarily disagree with you. I do think interior mm-hmm. offensive line was another position they needed to look at. Yeah. Um, and they did, so I don't know if that's the pick I would have gone. Uh, maybe even taking out Jason Huntley and going, maybe grabbing a guy mm-hmm. there, but that's how much value you're getting there. Exactly, um, that's what I was saying for, for looking at higher rounds. Right, the guy they got for they signed from the Eagles, by the way, is the uh, offensive tackle Vitae. That's the guy they signed from the Eagles. Right. Uh, Nick thinking. Williams. Nick Williams is a defensive tackle from the Bears that they yeah. signed. Um, but so it, it looks to me like the interior D line is going to be very much a rotational situation uh, yeah. between uh, Danny Shelton, Nick Williams, uh, John Penasini, And then um, even maybe even if he makes the roster, their seventh round draft pick into Sean Cornell. So we'll find out how that pans mm-hmm. out and where they fit on this, uh, where they fit in this depth chart along that D line. Mm-hmm. Um, now, do you think it's kind of telling, that the Lions did wait till the sixth and seventh round to grab interior linemen. Interior linemen. Do you think it tells you that you know maybe they're a little they're a little what than what a little more confident in what they have on that interior line than what us fans? Not necessarily. And the reason is, mm-hmm. I, I felt like they just valued or they looked at the other holes that they had in. Um, along their offensive line and at some of the skill positions as higher needs at the time, I, I felt like mm-hmm. they, they pr- appreciated the depth. They had a little bit more. I still don't think they, they have anything kind of in terms of high end talent at, along the D line. But I also think that due to the fact that these are essentially part time players along the D line as run stoppers, because none of these guys are really big time interior pass rushers. So they're 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 there to do one job and one job only, and that's stop the run. So you're only playing them on running downs. So that's why I think that some of these guys are looked at as and, and if that's the guy that they want to go for is a guy that's purely there to stop the run, those really aren't necessarily guys you grab in the in the third, fourth rounds. Those are guys you do grab a little bit later in the draft. So um maybe that's what they looked at it also. Yeah. Um now 
let's give the before because I do want to take a quick look at undrafted free agents. But before well, we do that, what did you think uh, of Deshaun Cornell? Because we didn't really mention him at all. Um, it was mm-hmm. just a last round pick, round seven, pick two thirty five, kid from Ohio State. It's a flyer, if you ask me. It's a guy who I think will compete for a roster spot with John Penasini and maybe some other uh, camp invites as well. Um, a guy that potentially could make the roster and be a rotational guy along that D-line also that just stopped the run. So I know the mm-hmm. Lions seem to really like guys from Ohio State this year, so let's see how yeah. some of them pan out. And and I think the reason you got confused with uh... – whether he was a defensive end, defensive tackle, I think he did play both in Ohio he State. He may have played three, uh, a mm-hmm. little bit of the end. I think you're right. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think the, the the big positive you can take away from him is the fact that he did. He's peaking at the right time, as in he's played his best football in his senior season, so or his final season. So I, I think that's a big positive you can take out just trying to Cornell. So you, he, you could say he's still getting better. Uh, so. You know, he could he could peek into something into something usable. Right. Um, you hope to see a guy uh get better over the final over the final season. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. let's hope he continues the progression. Mm-hmm. Uh so let's go ahead and take a quick look at undrafted free agents before we close things out. Well, real quick, I want I did want to grade the draft before we look at that. Um and I was to me, I, it's a B plus. I uh, do think you lost your way a little bit towards the uh toward once you hit the uh but um, and then the other downgrade I give is just not being able to successfully find a trade partner in the first round. Um, but other than that, I think he did. Uh, Bachman actually did a better job than I was expecting. I'm gonna agree with you on the B plus, uh, very high B plus, like mm-hmm. one tick below an A minus. And I'll and I'll hi, yeah. you know, agree with you on not being able to find a trade partner and grabbing a cornerback mm-hmm. as high as they did. I think that's an, a negative. Even mm-hmm. even with I like the pick, I think it was just still too high, and I think you could have traded back. And then I do think I do agree that they may have lost their way towards the end of um, the end of the draft as well, and maybe they could have done a couple of different yeah. things to go a little bit more of a position of need and, and got a little bit more value mm-hmm. at it. Uh, I, I, if they yeah. would have grabbed Bradley and Nye in the fifth round, I, I'd have been ecstatic and given this an A. Um, but oh, easy. Either way, though, at, at a very high B plus, I think in my mind, in terms of all around, I think this is Bob Quinn's best draft. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, he screwed around and ended up doing really a job. He filled positions of need and did it with high tier and high and did it for the most part with high tier talent and uh, great value. So I think he did a really good job playing the draft board and, and getting the picks that he needed to fill the holes on the roster. So oh, sorry, thought he did a really good job. Uh all right, so let's look at undrafted free agents. I'm going to start off because I have three, and it's for the most part, totally homer. I'm just going to be openly admitting it. But let's start with the non-homer pick here. This is actually a guy that I was um, I was through the line to take, so I saw that he was still available because he was one of the best defensive tackles on the board for much of like the sixth and seventh rounds. That is Benito Jones out of Mississippi. Hundred percent agree. Um, so know, I think you could again get another interior line asset and someone who may even be able to out compete the uh, sixth and seventh round picks that you grabbed. I actually agree with you. I I, mm-hmm. I think that that is a position that the Lions should look at in mm-hmm. in terms of the uh, undrafted uh, undrafted free agents here. Uh, it's a guy mm-hmm. just because you didn't use a higher draft pick on that position. I think Benito Jones mm-hmm. is the guy that can come in and compete for a job and maybe even compete for a rotation spot here. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't mind to see the Lions go after him either. I, I like I like that one a lot. Yeah, I think he got – I really do think – because I think he is a really good player. I just think he he really fell off like in terms of people's draft boards because of his size. In terms of his height and length, he's, he's only 6'1", which is kind of small for a defensive lineman. Uh, only about a 33-inch wingspan. Right. That, I think that's uh, and short arms at that short bit. arms at that position is something mm-hmm. that can really negatively affect you just because you're not able to reach out and grab yeah. the running backs as easily. So yeah, that is something that can exactly. really negatively affect you. Uh, my other guy, and this is where my homer picks begin. Um, Joe Bocci, linebacker, Michigan State. <laughs> now was he I the one it... that had uh, the drug issues? Uh, Joe Bocci's already been signed. Did Joe, he? Yes, already. he signed with the New Orleans Saints. That was quick. Yes, he signed. How quickly did this article come out? Oh well, 
an hour ago. An hour ago. So he's already mm-hmm. been signed. Um, so we can just well, drop that. I, I agree with you. Well, I will... Basically, almost when we basically when we started prepping the show is when he signed. Yes, he did. He did get suspended for the final five games of the uh, regular season for Michigan State due yeah. to PEDs. So mm-hmm. he, that was probably Which could be what caused him. To and it's probably fall. a big reason why he dropped, um, mm-hmm. and, and ended up not being drafted. So, but well, he is getting a shot in the NFL. Then. Yep, Joe Bocci is no longer available. Uh, the other guy I was going to say was defensive tackle Ray Con Williams out of Michigan State. Uh, Another guy that was actually supposed projected to be a day three selection that did not get drafted. But if you notice, I'm kind of hammering the defense with these. Uh, <laughs> with these uh, Benito free. Jones is also signed. He's signed by Benito the Miami Jones Dolphins. Got signed? Yes, he's signed by the Miami Dolphins. Damn it, Lions! <laughs> so let's see who is available. Raekwon yeah. Williams has been signed by the Philadelphia Eagles. Well, there go all three of my uh, <laughs> free agents. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, I mean, that's really the guys I would have looked at also. Not going to lie yeah. to you. Um, I think maybe Nick Coe, the uh, Auburn off- mm-hmm. the edge rusher. Let's see where he went. Um, again, I'm Another a big believer. Signed. I'm a big believer in. <laughs> I actually don't think he's been signed yet. Oh, there you go. All right. Um, I'm a big believer in drafting or er, going after young pass rush talent and just pass rush, pass rush talent in general, just because of the fact that you can never have too many of them. It's just one of those positions that you can never have too many of them. And the reason is because the fresher they are, the more ready they are to go in and make a play happen, the, the better, especially when they're coming in against tired offensive linemen, they're fresh, they're ready to go. They can come in and make a play and, and wreak some havoc in the backfield. And if you have a, a plethora of guys who you can trust to be in your rotation along that edge to wreak some havoc in the backfield, I would love to see them get as many of those guys as they're able to. And I think Nick Coe would be a guy who could potentially compete for a, a spot in the rotation on this in camp here. So um, yeah. I would like to see that. Agreed. Um, that, those, those were the three I had. I didn't do any kind of research on anybody else. So <laughs> I was pretty set with those three. I thought well, I was they're all gone. Him. They're all gone now, so good try. <laughs> not, I think that'd be announced that quickly. <laughs> uh, some of those guys end up going pretty quick. They really do. Yeah. Um, also, if you oh, want did you see the, did you see the Patriots see the kicker in the fifth? <laughs> I did see that. Oh man, uh, the Patriots they... draft was very interesting. I'm not gonna lie. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I I mean, they took a what they take a D two wide receiver, D two safety, or something like that in the second round or something. Mm-hmm. Um, who in all in their defense? I was, when I was watching the game, the game tape they showed on TV, he he looked like a ball hawk. That he, oh, he looked okay. like he could he looked like he could play. Okay, but one thing: if you're in the <laughs> if you're looked at in the NFL draft and you're a D two player, you better look really damn good on tape. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's how you like, get drafted from D two. You <laughs> better look like the next Troy Palomalu or Brian Dawkins mm-hmm. on tape if you're a D two player and you're that highly touted in the draft. So. Yeah. Um. I sure hope he looked real good. Mm-hmm. But either way, the 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 Pats, the Pats uh, draft always is weird. They always yeah. go with weird weird guys in weird spots, and they end up panning out sometimes. At least usually, that's how they're mm-hmm. they've had the sustained success that they've had. So yeah. Um. But anything else I, to add? Yeah. Final. Do you if you if you're the Lions, do you sign Brian Lewerke? No, I'm not. I'm not signing Lorky or Patterson. I, I I don't see a reason. I don't think either one of them are all that good at quarterbacks. So. I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100. <laughs> um, that's, that's all I got. Uh, that's about all I got too. Better than uh, expected three days for the Lions. Oh, absolutely agree. I I think they actually had a successful draft this year. Yeah albeit didn't do what I wanted them to do in the first round, but you know what mm-hmm. they did, they filled needs and that's what yeah. they needed to do. So I, I have hopes moving forward here, which mm-hmm. I did, I'll be honest with you. Did not expect to have going at, at this point. Yeah. I did not expect to be happy and have a bunch of hope going into uh, this, this recording here today. So by the way, actually I should address one more thing before we sign off. Yeah, I did notice I was uh, surfing a little Reddit a little bit during the draft, and I noticed a lot of people uh, clamoring for Den- uh, Donovan Peoples Jones because he kept falling, and people really wanted him apparently. Because you know, obviously, a lot of Michigan fans are 
fans, just like the Lions Michigan State fans are Lions fans. Uh, would you like the idea of us taking Don Peoples Jones over the receiver we took? I'll be honest with you. You want to know my thoughts mm-hmm. about Donovan Peoples Jones? Yeah, what's up? A lot of smoke, but no, a lot of a lot of sizzle, but no steak. There you it's, go. <laughs> he's, he's a guy who it's a, there's a lot of smoke, but I don't think there's a lot mm-hmm. of production. Um, he's a yeah. guy who had so much talent, so much potential, mm-hmm. and I just never thought he was all that great when it came to U of M. I thought he was a good receiver, but not a great receiver. Um, he's huge. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about that. He's a yeah. bigger receiver. Agreed. Um, he doesn't take cuts that well. Uh, it, when he gets jammed at the line for a big receiver, he struggles with them. Um, I I don't think he has really threatening high end speed off the out of the off the line either. I, again, he's a good receiver, but I don't know that he'll ever be a game breaking receiver. Um, and spending where what did he end up getting drafted round six? I yeah. I also like the receiver yeah. we got the Browns better personally. So I I, mm. may, I kind of I guess I don't know I. I don't know. I don't know that he would have been a guy that I would have really been overly ecstatic to see. I know a lot of people like him, but again, a lot of sizzle, no steak. So mm-hmm. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's, that's all I got. Um, that's all I got too. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for joining me. Uh, and thank you guys for listening. Yes, we hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you guys next week. Uh, go lions. Happy with the and- draft this year. Hit us up at Real Fan Report on Twitter if you want to continue talking about the draft. Yep, that's the Twitter. Uh, hit us up there. Hit us. Hit us up with a follow. Uh, if you have any comments or questions or anything like that, you know, hit, send us a DM or right right on our Twitter walls or whatever Twitter feed. There we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we sound like two dads right now. I know, so. right? Uh, <laughs> hit us up on the on the twatters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Where you kids use these days? The TikToks. The t- <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Um, speaking of, uh, did you what was going? Did you see the the uh, Mike Vrabel's uh, draft room where it looked like someone was taking a shit in the background? I did not see. Oh, that. go look that shit up. It's funny. Well, it's that. funny. Um, and then uh, yeah. there was a lot of really funny things that happened at the, mm-hmm. in go, panning to people's oh. draft rooms. I mean, I I, my favorite part was when they followed in the booze for Roger Goodell. In the very you know what? Beginning. We, it was coming. We, Keep coming. we asked for that, and you know what? We got it. We <laughs> got over. it. Yeah. I was so Respect happy. Respect to Roger Goodell for delivering on that. <laughs> Apparently, he says it's one of his favorite traditions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love seeing Bill Belichick's dog taking over drafting. We now yep. get to see why the Patriots draft is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but also, did you see, uh, what was it? CD lamb snatched the phone out of his girlfriend's hand. Yep. Saw that too. (laughs) Oh man. (laughs) There's a lot of, there's a lot of funny things that happened uh, uh, when they panned over the video. Cause I'm curious if they actually knew they were, uh, I mean, they knew the cameras Mm -hmm. were there, but I knew, I was wondering if they actually knew that the camera switched over to them. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyways, though, that is all I have. Thank you guys again, and we will catch you next week. This has been the Fan Forest. Bye, fans. For fans. See you guys next week. Be safe, be happy, be healthy, and stay indoors. Go Lions. Peace.